79, you released the horror business 45, which is three songs, and uh, the uh, Night of the Living Dead 45, which is three songs. Yeah. Glenn has talked about how some of their subject matter is just writing about real life, and I guess that's what he's referring to. Get me hooked, want me to marry, get a home, settle down, or write a book. Uh -uh. Too much monkey business. Too much monkey business. Too much monkey business for me to be involved in. Uh, while other people were reading, you know, some dorky crap, I was reading, you know, Edgar Allan Poe and Baudelaire and things like that. So. And it just sprung from that. And on TV, I was just watching old horror movies and, like, you know, crime, so, and Elvis, you know, so that's it. <laughs> when I was a kid, we called it playing hooky, but I was cutting school, pretending I was sick. Jailhouse Rock came on with Elvis. And I was like, I want to do this. This is great. <laughs> you know, I talk about this all the time. The title track, Horror Business, is kind of a juxtaposition of the movie Psycho with the true crime uh, murder of Nancy Spungen by Sid Vicious, although supposedly she was killed by a heroin dealer who came into the room and tried to steal all their money from one of Sid's gigs, and she got stabbed in the gut in the bathroom. And so that's why, you know, you have that lyric, you don't go in the bathroom with me, you know, I'll put a knife right in you and warning you. But it's funny, when I first heard that, I was like, oh, but I've right in you. You know, you're not, like, thinking about what the lyrics are. It just kind of all blends together. And then you realize you're saying, oh, I'll put a knife right in you. But not really. It was more on the violent side of it, you know? And that's that side of it that was shown. Why do you want to show the violent side? Because I like violence. I think it's part of the world. Do you? Do I like violence? Do you think that violence is part of the world? Oh, naturally, violence is part of the world. Oh, there you go. Well, it's, it's only normal to write about things that you see a lot of and that you experience a lot of. So that's what I like to do. Now, is that <coughs> so? Is that the stuff that you write about? Then is that pro-violence or is that or aware of violence? I wouldn't say anti-violence, but aware of violence that exists. Yeah, more like that. I don't know. You see, basically I just come up with an idea, and if I want to write about it, I do, and I'll take it wherever I... Usually I'll start writing lyrics, and they'll take me where I want to go, or they'll take me where they want to go. As far as lyrically, really nobody lyrically, um, I probably get more influence from, you know, literature. Mm -hmm. You know, as opposed to singer-songwriters. Right. Yeah. As far as lyrics, as far as words. words. Okay, as far as words go, that, like that kind of stuff, right? There's only one person right now, and always has been only one person who I really, really like, and that's Bukowski. Charles Bukowski. Charles Bukowski. When you write, your words must go like this. Mm. Bim, bim, bim. Bim, bim, bim. Bim, bim, bim. Bim, bim, bim. Each line must be full of a delicious little juice, flavor. They must be full of power. They must make you like to turn a page. Bim, bim, bim. Well, how'd you come across the concept? Did you do the music first or the lyrics first? or did you? I don't have any set standards. Sometimes I come up with great lyrics. Sometimes stuff is like poetry or whatever, you know. I just work in like bullet. Yeah. That was all poetry and stuff I did. Horror and politics kind of go hand in hand. Because that's what it is. Yeah. Politics is horror. The bullet 45 was the violent side of, of what we were doing. You know, the death, you know, mm -hmm. accepting death and all that kind of stuff. And, the, uh, maybe even a political side, you know. I always wanted to have stuff that lasted and wasn't just here for a year or two. I wanted to write stuff that people would be coming back to 20, 30 years later. When we we're doing the, the legacy shows, uh, it's it's nice when you know people are singing and you don't even have to sing really if you want. You just put the mic out there singing every word. It was nice. The release also came with an insert with a fictionalized story uh, written by my good friend, Dave Street. Who am I? Who was I? Well, back in the punk days, I, uh, I, for a while, they tell me I was a punk comedian. I have a record that proves it, I think. He was uh, a one-time pseudo manager when they were trying to negotiate uh, gigs with the damned at Haraz. This is... 
an EP called Horror Business, and there's an insert that any true Misfits uh, fan is uh, familiar with. Okay, I'm not going to tell you the truth about the whole thing, but I will tell you that Glenn and I talked about it, and it was his suggestion that I write this. But basically, the idea being that they recorded it in a, an abandoned haunted house. When they were mixing the tapes, they heard strange noises, which only could have been uh, at this mobile recording studio in a haunted house. That's impossible. On February 28, 1979, the Misfits and a mobile recording unit entered an abandoned haunted house in northern New Jersey. They recorded and left. While mixing the tapes back at an NYC studio, strange voices and noises were heard in the background. Note, especially Teenagers from Mars. No explanation of these sounds could be given by the band or recording crew. The following tracks on this record are a result of that eerie session. Dave Street. Jerry only mentioned in a 1993 interview, what happened was there was a weird sound on there. We didn't know where the hell it came from, so we said, what are we going to do? Are we going to remix it? And I said, well, I don't got no money. This is it. You got to like what you got. Then we thought about it, and we thought, we don't want everybody to think we're a bunch of jerks. So then I mentioned it. Hey, let's just say it was recorded in a haunted house, and everybody loved that. Uh, so that's Jerry's uh, explanation for why there was the insert. After they made that recording, I think Len let me listen to it. And I think we said, wow, somebody should write something down. I think Len said, yeah, why don't you write what we were just talking about? I think that's how I ended up writing that insert. Because I think everyone knows you better beware and you don't mess with a Misfits record. These songs would eventually make their way onto the Misfits' first compilation before Misfits Collection 1 or 2, uh, an EP called Beware that was put out on Cherry Records out in England. Beware the Misfits. This is my copy. And what made that release so sought after was that it had an unreleased track, Last Caress, uh, supposedly suggested to Glenn by Bobby Steele himself. It's made out to somebody that nobody knows. It says, To Sadu, and nobody knows who Sadu is. I am... So, I don't know who Sadu is unless, unless that was their nickname for me or Natasha. Horror Business marks the first time that we would see the Crimson Ghost, which would eventually be co-opted by the Misfits as their mascot logo. Uh, the skull that would go on to infect every corner of the underground pop culture of the 80s and 90s, which would eventually take over the world. We used that skull on some buttons and stuff. You know, I wish I had the buttons, but it was just it was just coming about. It was nothing like that. On your records, Misfits was, the symbol was a skull. Samhain, the symbol is a skull. What's the fascination with skulls? As to Glenn Danzig. I just think they look cool. Dave Achilles was the producer, and it was mastered by Rich Flores.